Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Yuri Burstyn. I'm a veterinarian in British Columbia, and this is young Claudia, the most squished cat on the internet. And we're here today to talk to you about feline asthma. Now, why should you be interested in this topic? Besides the obvious reason that medicine and physiology are super fun. Uh, well, I think feline asthma is one of the most underdiagnosed feline health conditions that also has a really significant impact on quality of life. So if I can help you understand a little bit more about feline asthma and spot it in your own cat, I think I will have done some good in the world. Our discussion of feline asthma will start with hairballs. Why hairballs, you may ask? Well, sometimes a hairball is not just a hairball. First of all, hairballs are when cat swallows some hair and then regurgitates it and they look like a little sausage of hair. They are not vomit with some hairs in it. They're literally, they look like a cat poo, but made out of hair and coming out the other end. Hairballs are a normal part of cat life, but frequency of hairballs will tell us a lot about whether your cat has asthma or not. So if you have a short haired cat, like young Claudia over here, you might see a hairball once a year or maybe once several years, and that's normal. If you have a long haired cat, like say a Maine Coon or similar breed or Persian maybe, then you could be seeing hairballs a little bit more regularly and that would still be normal because they ingest a lot of hair during grooming and then hairballs are not that useful in tracking asthma. But if you see a short head cat like Claudia that's throwing up hairballs more than once a year, there's a very good chance your cat has asthma. The other thing that might tip you off to your cat's asthmatic condition is a cough because people often think an asthma attack in a cat looks like coughing. So if your cat coughs and throws up hairballs, there is a pretty darn good chance, I'm talking about like 90% plus chance, your cat is having an asthma attack. At this point in the conversation when I talk about this with my clients, I usually show them a video of a cat having an asthma attack. I've been using these videos off of YouTube for many, many years since the beginning of my career. And quite frankly, most of the time, I find that if I just show people a video of a cat having an asthma attack, I immediately get either uh, absolutely, yes, this is what I'm seeing at home, or uh, no, that's not what it is, doc. And almost always it is correct. Notice a couple of features. Our cat is crouching, making a coughing sound, the neck is extended because they're struggling to breathe, and often there are abdominal contractions. This is a classic cat asthma attack. So why does it look this way? Well, to explain that, we need to understand what asthma is. And the best explanation of asthma I've ever heard of was during a conference sitting next to a human allergist uh, in Alberta when I was hanging out with my brother, who's an epidemiologist. And he said, well, asthma is just allergies in your lungs. That's all it is. When you have an allergic reaction in your skin, your skin gets red and inflamed. When you have an allergic reaction in your eyes, your eyes get watery and red. And when you have an allergic reaction in your bronchi, they get red and inflamed, and that causes them to spasm, which causes a cough. You also produce some mucus, which occludes your airways, which makes you cough more and makes it hard to breathe. An asthma attack is just when you're coughing, you're struggling to get air down into your airways because your bronchi are constricting. It is allergies in your lungs. If you stop watching the video right now, you'll be able to go home and decide whether your cat ever has asthma attacks. Now, like all allergies, asthma can be seasonal. If you're allergic to something that's only in the air occasionally, or it can be year-round if you're allergic to something that's in the air year-round. And you will sometimes see patients who have asthma attacks only at certain times of the year, and you will see patients who will have asthma attacks all year-round. The important thing to remember is that for every asthma attack you see in your cat, there's probably three you don't see. So even a mild or rare case of asthma in your cat is worth investigating because it's distressing, it's uncomfortable, and it's worth fixing. Usually in a veterinary environment, Asthma gets diagnosed when the client comes to the vet complaining about a coughing cat. And if their vet is switched on, they will ask, does your cat ever bring up hairballs? And then just walk you through what I just walked you through. Then we can use tools to confirm our suspicion, which at this point is probably gonna be 90%, of whether your cat actually has asthma or not. And this is the important part. You can't skip this step, because even though you can be 90% sure it's asthma based on history and presentation, you need a chest x-ray, not only to confirm the diagnosis, but also to rule out other things that can look like asthma. For example, a pulmonary abscess. 
cancer, a foreign object stuck in your lungs, pneumonia, walking bronchitis, COPD, all of these things can present same as asthma. You need to rule them out, so you do need to do a chest x-ray on all of these cases, and that's what your veterinarian will recommend. Note here, three-view chest x-rays. There are no such thing as a one-view chest x-ray. There is no such thing as a two-view chest x-ray. There are only three-view chest x-rays and more. If anybody tells you they can do a chest x-ray with less than three views, that person needs a remedial course in radiology, and you should probably seek medical help elsewhere. So, chest x-ray. And now, we're going to show you what a typical chest x-ray looks like in a cat with asthma. You will note that the bronchi are quite prominent. Uh, you can see these little donut signs, which are little bronchi that are end-on, because, of course, uh, we're looking at a 3D structure in two dimensions, so a tube that's coming towards you will look like a donut. And the reason they look so prominent and white is because they are inflamed and thickened. Like I said, that's the definition of asthma. The changes can be quite subtle, or they can be really dramatic. But based on the history and on the chest x-ray, one can confidently establish a diagnosis of asthma and nothing else. Now, in some cases, further testing may be required. For example, some vets might want to run a blood test on these cats. Eh, it's neither not wrong or right, in my opinion. But the real tool for confirming this diagnosis that we almost never need to use is called a bronchoalveolar lavage or a bronchial brushing. The reason we almost never need to use this tool is because usually things are pretty freaking obvious based on x-rays and history. But there are certain cases where there's maybe really bad changes on the x-ray and you want to rule out other forms of lung inflammation or cancer. Um, there may be some cases where, uh, let's just say, things aren't that clear. And then a bronchial viral lavage or bronchial brushing will be useful. Those are procedures that are usually done under anesthetic. And what they do is ultimately they collect samples of cells from the lower airways that can be looked at under a microscope. And then based on the cells and what they look like and what they contain, you can pretty confidently say what the underlying disease process is. But, you know, it's expensive, requires an anesthetic. Uh, so usually we don't do it if you don't have to. And most of the time you don't have to. By the way, if you're finding this video helpful and useful, please don't forget to like, subscribe to the channel, squish that bell notification icon so you get to see more of us and get more helpful tips. And please follow me on Patreon, where you can support my work educating the public and producing high-quality animal health educational videos. And you can also seek out second opinions from me on your own pet's case if you like. And your support is very much appreciated. And of course, if you know anybody whose pet has asthma or who, you know, somebody has a cat who's coughing, please share this video with them. They might find it helpful. Okay, so what do we do now that we have a diagnosis of feline asthma? Claudia? What do we do? What do we do? Well, like everything else in veterinary medicine, we treat to quality of life. Ultimately, if you ask anybody who has asthma attacks, they'd probably rather have less, preferably zero. Having said that, if you have a really mild case of asthma and you know your cat throws up a hairball three times a year and you catch her coughing twice, in my hands, in my client base, I might say, well, do you really need to treat this? Maybe, maybe not. Kind of make that decision together with the owner. On the other hand, if you have a cat who's having asthma attacks like every week that the owner is seeing, means she's probably having asthma attacks every day that the owner is not seeing. And in those cases, I would advocate for treatment quite aggressively. And of course, there's going to be a whole range of cases in between. Ultimately, we have to make a decision together with your veterinarian about whether this is impacting your cat's quality of life. And if it's impacting their quality of life negatively, then it's worth treating. And luckily, we have really effective treatments for asthma. Now, here's I'm going to diverge from a segment of my profession. A lot of veterinarians will put these cats on corticosteroids, specifically pernicillone. I really don't like to do that because pernicillone has a lot of very severe side effects. And while it is a very effective tool at controlling inflammation, there are better and safer tools available to us. The only time I will use pernicillone is if you have a very severe case with a lot of lung changes, you have no other health concerns, and then I will use it maybe for a week or two just at the start of treatment to make things easier on the cat. I will not use it for extended period of time. And ultimately, often you don't really need to use it at all because you have inhalable medication. Now, all of you with asthma will recognize this. This is an asthma inhaler or an asthma puffer. We can use these in cats. 
But unfortunately, we can't just use them in cats the way we do in humans. Right, Claudia? Claudia, will you take a puff? No. The answer is she will not take a puff. And if I puff this in her face, it'll startle her, it'll scare her, and she will hate me forever. Okay, that's not true. She's going to hate me for 30 seconds. But she will definitely not let you puff her in the face with this thing again. So, we use something called an AeroCat. This is actually a pediatric spacer used to deliver inhaled medications to a baby, rebranded as a pediatric spacer used to deliver <laughs> inhaled medications to a cat. And I'm going to show you how it works, but first I'll tell you what to put in it. There are two things we might want to use for this. Now, this is salbutamol. It is used to dilate your bronchi. It's a bronchodilator. Salbutamol is what most asthmatics use just when they have an asthma attack to relieve their symptoms. We don't use this in cats very often. I will send cats home with this if they're coughing like every day and are really miserable and this will make them feel better. And doing it two or three times a day will make them feel better for a little while until we get their underlying disease under control. Most of the time, what we will use to control asthma in cats is a different inhaler that contains a corticosteroid. Remember I said that pernicillone and oral corticosteroid is a bad idea? Well, it's a bad idea because it has systemic side effects. An inhaled corticosteroid gets a high concentration into the lungs where you want it to work with minimal systemic absorption. And if you really want to quibble, you can say, sure, you can have some systemic side effects with long-term inhaled corticosteroid use, you know, if you want to be pedantic about it. But most of the time, you will see none. It is way safer than oral medication. And typically, especially the regimens that we use them in cats, the cats are just going to be just fine. So really a superior tool for controlling feline asthma to oral pernicillone. And most of the time, I just send cats home with this. We often start out using it like twice a day, then we go down, then as the symptoms improve, we go down to once a day, then every other day. Our goal is to manage a cat with like puffs two, one or two times per week. And the reason that works is because corticosteroids are anti-inflammatory and inflammation is a self-perpetuating process. That means that if you break that process, it'll take a long time to ramp up. So you break it with frequent administration, and then you can often control it with really rare administration, and then you don't have to worry about side effects. So great tool for the job. And again, in very severe cases, I'll send them home with a salbutamol puffer as well. But we're back to the issue of how do we get a cat to take a puffer? Well, let me demonstrate. So just as a disclaimer, I have never done this with Claudia. She has never had a puffer. Uh, so this will be uh, an experiment for everyone. And uh, as with everything else cat related, I'm going to remind you guys to squish that cat because squishing her is how you make this work. So we have this little puffer, this little mask that goes over your cat baby's face. And there's a space here which you can insert the puffer. So what I do first is without the puffer inserted, I try to get the cat used to having this over their face. As you see, the cat does not love it. There we go. But that's all it takes. So when we administer this medication, we do have to hold this over the face for about 30 seconds. When you do it at home, I strongly encourage you to make this as nice for your cat as possible. Squishing them is actually going to make them stay in one place, be comfortable, be warm, and allow you to hold that in one place without them fighting you. It's way more stressful if the cat's like thrashing about and fighting you while you're doing this. So a good squish is key. A great form of positive reinforcement is just to give a cat a treat that they really like after you give them a puffer. It may not make it super easy. It may not be quick to get them used to accepting this, but it will make life a little bit better for both of you. And in some cases, it'll make the cat look forward to getting a puffer, which is be just awesome. All right, so let's try this. We're gonna put this over our little cat's face. We're gonna deliver medication into it, and then we'll hold it there for 30 seconds or as close as we can get it. And really, don't torture yourself or your cat. Do the best job you can. It'll still be better than nothing. And if uh, you can't do 30 seconds, but you can do 15, you still will have done some good in the world. All right, ready, Claudia? So look, we're gonna put the puffs into here. We're gonna preload the chamber. My dear, stick around. You don't even know what's coming and you're already trying to crawl away. We're gonna preload the chamber with puffs. We've got two puffs, one, two, and immediately put this over the cat's face. And Good squish. One Mississippi, two Mississippi. Notice I started in the bad position with Claudia far away from me. 
If I was really a good cat squisher, I would have started with her in my arms, all cuddled up. Notice she's breathing. There's a little valve in there, so she's breathing the medication. And when she exhales, it closes. Yeah, I don't know if it's been 30 seconds, but this is probably good enough. Wow, look at that. We just administered an inhaled medication to a cat for the very first time, and Claudia probably feels fantastic. You know, I'll give myself a puff as well. <coughs> Oof. A bit of pollen in here. So, there you go. That's how you treat a cat with asthma. Notice how easy it is. Good squish technique really helps. A little bit of mentorship from your vet may be required, but notice I think that anybody can do this, but you got to have the right tools for the job. Called an AeroCat or a Pediatric Spacer Mask. Pretty easy, right? So, a couple small nuances to this treatment. First of all, you may need to do this for a few months and then stop when your cat looks perfectly good and your cat may stay asymptomatic for the rest of the year if it's a seasonal asthma or if you just successfully break that cycle of inflammation and it doesn't build up again. There's going to be some variation between bodies and how fast that happens. So you don't necessarily have to do this year-round. You just do it to effect. And if you do it and your cat no longer has any coughing fits or asthma attacks for, few, like, say, two, three weeks, then I think it's safe to discontinue it and see how long you get. If they start to ramp up again, you just start treating again. That way we get minimal treatment for maximum quality of life. And that's always our goal when managing chronic health conditions. The other nuance that we need to be aware of is that mycoplasma are a type of bacteria that are present in roughly 30% of cats. They're really hard to detect and they can cause a mycoplasmal pneumonia, which is functionally indistinguishable from asthma. It looks the same on x-rays. It looks the same clinically. You probably don't need to do a BAL or bronchial viral lavage or bronchial brushing to try to differentiate between them. What you do need to do is do a month of an antibiotic treatment called doxycycline the very first time your cat's asthma is diagnosed. You still treat with the inhaled medication, but combine that with 30 days of doxycycline. In some cases, the cough will go away and never come back, and in those cases, you probably just fixed a mycoplasmal pneumonia. But really, just doing that treatment trial is way more effective and probably safer and just nicer to your cat than anything else. But you probably should not skip that step because if your cat does have mycoplasmal pneumonia, then the puffer is just not going to work that well, it could potentially cause complications. You just don't want to do it. Plus, doxycycline is a funny antibiotic. It has anti-inflammatory action. So even if your cat doesn't have mycoplasmal pneumonia, the anti-inflammatory action of doxycycline will still help reduce the inflammation in the bronchi and help manage the symptoms of asthma. So there's really no big downside to doing it. The other thing that might be worth being aware of is that cats do tend to be quite predisposed to autoimmune diseases. And if your cat has asthma, that you should probably have an increased level of vigilance for other autoimmune diseases. Things like lymphocytic plasmacytic gingivitis. You can check out my video on periodontal disease uh, to learn all about dental disease in cats. And you'll notice in that video, I talk about how some cats have really bad gingivitis, so like inflamed bleeding gums, even though their teeth are perfectly clean. We think that some of those cats might have an autoimmune gingivitis. And again, we, there's a general line of thought, maybe not conclusively proven, this could be argued, but that cats with one autoimmune disorder are predisposed to developing others. So for example, cats with asthma might benefit from a bit more vigilance to their oral health. And of course, there's a number of other more serious autoimmune disorders that could come up. Again, having a history of asthma that's well controlled will, might help your doctor diagnose these disorders. And certainly having asthma under control will make management of these disorders easier, might even prevent them from coming out because autoimmune system talks to itself. And chronic inflammation is not good for you and can potentially trigger more chronic inflammation now we're getting a bit into like perhaps controversial or at least pretty high level immunology. Uh, that's probably beyond the scope of this video, but let's just say there's really no downside to controlling inflammation and maybe a significant upside. So now you probably know everything you wanted to know about feline asthma and then some. Thank you very much for watching. Please share this with anyone you think might benefit from it and hope you have a lovely day. I'll see you next time.